Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster. Oh boy. It's not that I didn't have any fun with this version. I'd be lying through my teeth if I said that. This is, at the end of the day, Dead Rising 1. Same story, same events, on the same map, with approximately the same gameplay. It's an easy game to just pick up and casually enjoy. At the same time, however... Okay, so part of the reason I didn't want a remake of Dead Rising is that I wasn't impressed with the Resident Evil 2 remake, or reimagining, as it should be known, and how it threw out a lot of the unique gameplay and elements of the original for something... a lot more generic. So when I saw the interviews of the devs saying that they wanted to keep as much of the original gameplay of Dead Rising 1 as possible, I actually got quite hopeful of this remake. But as more information came out, as the censorship got shown, as the voice acting and gameplay was displayed more and more, and as I finally got my hands on the game itself, well, there's a reason this game had almost no marketing and was outsourced to the company behind those terrible Resident Evil multiplayer games. Actually, it really makes me wonder if this game would have been as faithful as it was if Capcom budgeted this title like it was something they had confidence in. And that's a shame, because I'm actually in the market for a better version of the first Dead Rising. While Dead Rising is my favorite video game franchise, Dead Rising is hardly my favorite entry in it. Probably a surprise to a lot of you, given my channel focuses almost exclusively on the first game. But that's because it's my favorite entry in the series to make videos on. In terms of just casually playing, Dead Rising 2, Off the Record, and 3 are far better games. And while the past few years on this channel have given me a newfound appreciation for the first Dead Rising, warts and all, it still has warts. And that's where my frustration starts to kick in. I was willing to put up with some of the things they were pulling with this game, like the censorship or the worse voice acting, if this was a better playing version of Dead Rising 1, or if it had enough new content to it. It is neither. It is not that there are no improvements whatsoever, but calling this a deluxe remaster is debatable at best. For every nice addition or idea, there's a questionable or detestable one. And then there's the presentation, the censorship, the many bugs and broken gameplay aspects that, while some are pretty minor, I am flabbergasted other reviewers are not bringing up. The hypocritical design choices, and the shocking lackluster use of the modern day technology this game was apparently built for. More than ever, for any entry in Dead Rising, I found myself asking, why was this made? And thus begins the review. I will be focusing on what is different in this version, what was added, and what wasn't added. It will get pedantic, and yes, this is going to skew negative. It's not with the intent of convincing you not to buy the game. I find stuff like that stupid. It's your money, it's your free time, your call. There is no guarantee you will value or care about any details I bring up here. And you know what you like out of Dead Rising better than I do. But even the more negative reviews of this game only cover very basic things. And there are a lot of shortcomings to this version I don't think are getting the attention they deserve. So, even if it comes off as nitpicking, I do want to cover where this version fell short for me. I'm assuming you're at least a little familiar with the core of Dead Rising and how it plays. Things that go unchanged, like the story, will be ignored. That said, grab a drink. This is going to be a long one. I'm just gonna rip the band-aid off. I don't like how this remake looks. It's not ugly, and the texture work is truly impressive, but the color palette is just so muted and muddy. While the entrance plaza and leisure park look really nice during the height of daytime, everything else just has a more, well, brown look to it. Not helping is the overly pronounced shadows in the mall proper, especially in the food court. It can make the already dull colors border on monochrome. Even Dead Rising 3's environment has the benefit of being designed with its desaturated visuals in mind. Whereas DRDR looks like the lighting just isn't working properly. Something not helped with the addition of neon bright bloom effects. I actually ended up turning the brightness up just to make things a little more vibrant. It helped during the day, but it made the bloom far worse at night. Speaking of Dead Rising 3, it's why I'm not impressed with the facial animations in the cutscenes. Not because they're bad, 
because they're not. Not because they aren't better than the OGs, because they are. But for a game Capcom said was rebuilt from modern technology, no one in this game ever gets quite as expressive as the characters in Dead Rising 3 were. This isn't entirely the remake's fault, as the game is still using the original cinematography, but it doesn't change that none of the conversations in the remake have that raw visual emotion that Nick and Gary's conversations did. I guess I'm just gonna wait for the inevitable. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Really, I am. I'm sorry. Hey, do you want me to off you? So you don't gotta suffer. Just hurry. Okay, I'll do it. I'm not the best shot. Give me a moment. Oh. That was my last bullet. The art style as a whole isn't that good either. Rather than recreate the original character models in the original art style, which the 2006 Frank pre-order bonus shows they were absolutely capable of doing, they instead remade the models, presumably scanning real-life actors who resemble the characters. And that's a big reason this remake falls into the uncanny valley so often. These aren't updated or improved models or designs, it looks like you're watching live-action actors cast as the characters. This is a problem that a lot of older games that had photorealistic visuals hit in modern-day times, as current technology eliminates the need of an art style to account for limitations. But even knowing why this happens doesn't change the fact that this game looks like I'm playing through a Netflix adaptation instead of an updated version of the original game, made worse by the voice acting. What in the hell are you people doing? Run! Quick, move! Get over here! Everyone, move this way! Quick, to the stairs! Move! We're doing this to survive. You know that. Look, mister, if we're gonna fight these zombies, we need guns! Stay back! I trust those damn zombies about as far as I can throw them. But I trust people even less. I was, uh, just about to shoot my... Peace de resistance. <laughs> okay, look, there are some good impressions in the game. Carlito, Isabella, Brock, Adam, and Paul of all people. But the voice cast is still worse across the board, with the main cast being jarringly off. Jessie definitely gets it better than most, as her new voice is very easy on the ears. However, she lacks any authority or strength her character should have as a government agent, rookie or not. No, I can't let a civilian do that. That's against regulations. Calm down, Dr. Barnaby. We're only following orders. I managed to stop the bleeding. But he's running a fever. He needs medicine. It makes it hard to buy that she's the one who's regularly challenging and backtalking Frank for the first third of the game. Anyway. Barnaby's VA struggles to convey the tired anger of the character, which is 70% of his dialogue. You! Stop right there! Do you have any idea what you've done? Why did you summon me to this place? What are you planning? Unfortunately, the biggest losers in terms of the voice direction is Frank and Brad. These two just do not have chemistry with each other in this rendition. Who is that? Where did you take- You help me, I help you. You're one hell of a journalist, aren't you, Frank? A hot-headed, underhanded, hot-shot paparazzi with nothing better to do than to invade people's privacy. I try. You got a point. Frank sounds like he's trying to match TJ's delivery, but misses most of the inflections, making a lot of his sarcasm especially fall flat. Well, we're up to our necks in zombies. Yeah, I think I appreciate the situation just fine. And Brad? except for when he's literally dying, sounds bored out of his mind, with most of his lines hitting the same vocal range, regardless of context. Everyone, move this way! Quick, to the stairs! Move! Where are the others? As long as those things are in the mall, we'd better not use this door. I will say the VA they got for Otis is pretty good. It fits his laid-back nature and is pretty accurate to how I imagined him sounding. But for the other survivors during gameplay, it gets rough. 
Much like the original, the survivors all share the same handful of voice actors. This was fine when it was just audio cues to signal the survivor's tone and emotions, but it gets pretty distracting when brought to full voice acting, especially compared to Dead Rising 3, which gave every survivor a unique voice. Oh, yeah. it looks so dangerous. <clears throat> Shit. How am I supposed to even use this thing? I'll kill myself. Um, maybe I can just come with you? Hey, are you okay? <laughs> I don't know what this is, but I can try. As messed up as this shit is, I can work with that, dog. I'd probably be more forgiving if the voices fit the characters better, but there are quite a few that just don't. Like, Gil's voice actor fits him really well, but hearing that same voice come out of Jeff and Kendall just doesn't sound right. Goddamn zombies, come on, come and get me. Hope you can hold your liquor, though, because I'm soaking in it. You! Have you seen my wife, Natalie? She should still be around here. It's just nice to see another human being around here. Well, a live one, at least. Eliza, or Alyssa, as this game goes with, is another character who just sounds off, as her simple dialogue and goofy animations in the original made her come off as a bit of an airhead, whereas now she just sounds like she's constantly angry despite still speaking in those very basic sentences. Will you shut up for once, Alyssa? Part of why this bothers me so much is that they chose not to bring back the original voice actors. While some would have to be recast, like Larry's VA who passed away back in 2020, most of them are still in the business, and the main characters certainly were. They said the expired contracts were why they didn't use the original audio, but they never mentioned why they had to recast specifically. Think about that. There is nothing stopping them from contacting and hiring the same actors to reprise their roles, or simply renewing the expired contracts, beyond Capcom and their divisions not wanting to pay union voice actors or hand out royalties. In fact, the lack of any reference to ever getting them to reprise their roles at all leads me to think the survivors are only fully voiced because they weren't able to use the original audio. TJ Rotillo, the true voice of Frank West, is the only actor who I could find confirmation is a union voice actor, as the rest that we saw in Dead Rising 1 were actually people known for working in television or theater, which is probably why Dead Rising 1 had a very different voice direction from other Capcom games up until that point. So I'd wager that the strikes going on with the voice acting union were unlikely to be a big roadblock. And, back in Dead Rising 4, you know, a time when this fanbase was willing to criticize a half-assed release, TJ mentioned that Capcom didn't even contact him to reprise Frank for that game, and that he would have absolutely tried to work something out with them. He said more or less the same thing this time around, that he always appreciates it when they offer him the chance to play Frank, implying, once again, no attempt was made to get him back. Between this, none of the Resident Evil voice actors returning for their remakes, and the Devil May Cry crew having to re-audition for characters they've been playing for over a decade for DMC5, it comes off that Capcom despite loving to pretend they reciprocate Western values, do not actually value their Western voice talents. Whew, okay, got that out of my system. I'm happy to say the sound design, as a whole, is pretty good. It's mostly just lifted straight from the first Dead Rising, which had fantastic sound design. Sadly, there were some sound effects that were replaced, and the new ones are a lot weaker. It, mostly the guns. They just don't have the same impact they did in Dead Rising 1, nor the Capcom Vancouver games.
There's also some sound effects that appear to be misplaced, like how it sounds like Frank is trying to drink a bag of frozen vegetables. But beyond these hiccups, sound design is pretty good. The same cannot be said for the UI. It's functional, but damn is it dull. The original UI was meant to resemble on-screen graphics your local news station would have, with the pause menu meant to be an information screen you would also see on a news station. Dead Rising 2 and Off the Record would keep the HUD in that style while having their own pause menus. Even Dead Rising 3 made the health blocks look as worn out as the city Nick was exploring, along with changing the hue to fit the game's visual style. While I do like that the map is a visual brochure of the mall in this remake, as well as the clipboard for achievements, it doesn't change the fact that the rest of the UI feels like a series of placeholder assets for better graphics that are never coming. And if we're gonna talk about placeholders, we have to bring up the usage of AI art. Specifically, Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster appears to have used AI art for most of the boxes, cans, and small details around the mall. Regardless if it's from the original game or a new asset, taking a moment to look at these smaller details will reveal that a lot of assets are somehow less legible than the OG game from 2006. Now, I don't mind AI creations in small games from teams clearly working on a limited budget. But this isn't that. This isn't five people in their shed trying to recreate flat out on a computer powered by hamsters. This is Capcom recreating their 2006 cult classic, but are unwilling to hire an artist for the smaller background props. I could go on, but you get the idea. Nothing in this game visually impresses me, with several bits even being direct downgrades. And the closer you look, the worse the visuals get. But why does that matter? Isn't gameplay the most important thing in the end? Conceptually, yes, I agree with that. When a new game is coming out, including a brand new Dead Rising game, if there's one aspect I'm willing to sacrifice, it's the visuals. But this isn't a new game. This is a remake that sold itself on taking advantage of modern technology. And beyond the raw texture work, I'm literally not seeing it. But you know what I am seeing? This game is censored the hell and back. I knew that going in, but I was willing to see if it was being overblown. That optimism lasted maybe five seconds, as the first screen, before any company logos, was effectively a trigger warning, while trying to ensure that nothing about the game outside of minor examples have been changed. Okay. Sure. So, there's a few major elements of censorship and their effects on the game that I want to go over here. The first, and most obvious, is the removal of erotica. Now, for anyone saying this was removed in the name of good taste, watch this. Just leave me alone! Huh. They hate her! Those damn zombies hate my baby! Right in front of me! Oh my god! I never heard her cry like that! Come on! Running? Why not just yeah. run the skateboard? <laughs> Silver lining. We can yeah, use our for anything we find in this mall for free. Yeah. You should yeah. stick to shooting porn. Good taste had nothing to do with it. They thought it would boost sales and PR to remove it. <laughs> this ends up negatively affecting two side missions. The first is Kent as he now asks for a funny image instead of a sexy one. In the original, it was meant to be the player's first indication that something wasn't quite right with Kent, and the candid nature of his image as well as his disturbing pride in it came off as psychotic. It just does not ring true in the remake, and takes away a big part of his creepy factor. It also makes his remark about shooting porn during his boss fight come out of nowhere. Cheryl's request is ironically a lot creepier in this version, it made some sense in the original with its perverted sense of humor, as having a side quest about someone actively requesting those kind of pictures ended up as a nice subversion. Here, it just comes out of nowhere, and hearing her fully voiced and speaking in a low, husky tone, while all of her shots give no genre bonuses, feels very unnatural. I can feel your eyes on me. Her. The survivors don't even react to it in this version, 
as some of them were made uncomfortable while others would cheer in the OG version, now they just blankly stare. The whole thing feels lifeless and forced. Finally, this makes all the time the camera leers over Jesse or Isabella's bodies feel really disturbing, when the only other time that the game does this in terms of cutscenes is Joe's assault on the young women she's handcuffed. Counterintuitively, these cutscenes are now far more awkward than they used to be. The next two are the psychopath sensors you might be familiar with. They won't take as long to go over, but they're probably more damning. Cliff has had all of his references to the Vietnam War removed, presumably so the game will sell better in China. The loss of this real-world reference makes Cliff's entire story less… well, real. It feels like a fake, generic interaction I would see on Nickelodeon because they can't get away with it. Not an M-rated game that advertises how realistic the gore effects have gotten. Similarly, the original version of Larry was apparently a racist stereotype, and that's why they had to change him. Let's just go along with that for the sake of argument. Why didn't they just make him less of a stereotype? Give him darker skin complexion. Give him whiter eyes. Give him his two front teeth back, he'd probably appreciate that. Why was whitewashing deemed the acceptable solution, and why is the internet suddenly okay with that? I thought that was the cardinal sin of entertainment. The final bit of censorship I want to talk about is the Raincoat Cult. No one brings this up for some reason, but the cult no longer prays. Instead they try to do... whatever the hell this is. I know it's supposed to be that they're channeling their third eye, but it looks like they're doing the Omni-Man pose or trying to activate laser vision. It's stupid. It takes away any threat they could have. Not that they have much threat in this version, but we'll get to that. I'd like to remind you that all of this, removing sexual elements, getting rid of the anti-communism rant, removing prayer from a religious cult, this is being done to an M-rated game. They are genuinely more concerned about that than all of the violence and gore going on in the game. There's an ongoing rumor that everything I just brought up was actually done to make the game sell better in China, not just the anti-communism statement being removed. If that's true, Capcom is so cheap they won't make a second version of the game for the Chinese audience specifically, like games used to be able to. If it's not true, then Capcom is so compromised that the first Dead Rising, the tamest entry in the series, was too spicy for their interpretation of the modern audience. It begs the question of how they ever hope to handle the sequels, which are far spicier and have more damning commentary. If they can't handle Kent, how are they going to handle Jerry, a boss about how toxic pride is and how it can destroy your ability to be identified? First things first. Be wary if you plan to get this game on Steam. I have been hearing a lot of bad news about the PC performance, from struggling to maintain 60 FPS, to the game repeatedly crashing. I didn't have those issues on the Xbox Series X, but PC gamers beware. As for the console experience, it was fine. The only time I had any framerate drops was using a queen on a horde of zombies, and I mean a large horde like 50 of them, at nighttime. The game just struggles to process all those mutated larvae all at once. Beyond that, the FPS was pretty smooth. Load times were comparable to the 2016 ports of the original game. Normal areas may have loaded a second or two faster, while loading a boss fight could be a second or two slower, but I'm willing to say the difference is negligible. What's not so negligible is the zombie count. It is considerably lower than the original. Now, in more condensed areas of the mall, like North Plaza, Alfresca Plaza, or the second floor of the entrance plaza, it might not be that noticeable. But it becomes glaring when you get to the more open spaces like Paradise Plaza, Wonderland, Leisure Park, and especially the maintenance tunnels. This has an effect on the difficulty of the gameplay, but we'll get to that later. For now, just know the game isn't as smart as the original when it comes to how it spawns zombies. That gets us to the worst part of the performance. The bugs. The launch version of Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster gives Dead Rising 4 a run for its money in terms of being the least stable entry in the series. The only reason I can't say it beats it outright is because I didn't lose track of how many times weapons fell through the floor in this game. Not saying it ever happened, it just wasn't a regular occurrence. But zombies will spawn in walls or the floor, items occasionally not spawning when entering an area, occasional inputs not registering, which cost me a few infinity mode runs thanks to the time speed up feature, zombies passing through Frank, 
zombies passing through Frank's attacks and then getting to bite him, enemy AI just forgetting what it's doing. But the worst is the raincoat cult. Every member is bugged, as they go from trying to activate their laser vision, to pulling out their knife, to doing the Omni-Man pose one last time before dying from a machete to the collarbone. I think the cult members landed a collective four attacks on me for my entire playthrough. Even Dead Rising 4's enemies didn't bug out this badly. Now, with that out of the way, I just want to ask, does anything I described here sound next-gen to you? Frame rate and routing that's at best on par with a port that came out eight years ago? A smaller zombie count? A lot of bugs to varying degrees of severity? Combine that with the lackluster presentation and the asinine censorship, and you have a lot of downsides before I even get into the gameplay. Now, to be clear, there are good things about the gameplay, so this review will have positives. But as I go over the pros and cons of the gameplay, keep in mind everything I've brought up thus far, and the fact that there are no extra survivors, missions, or side content not found in the original game. Okay, since I just spent a while being rather critical, let's go over some new additions for a few positives here and there. The checkpoint system from Off the Record returns, and now functions as a proper save. Given that I had a few things that required me to suddenly go do something when recording this, I actually got way more use out of this than I expected. The game also allows the player to create a suspend point in the Infinity Mode. It's like the quick save from the new Super Mario Bros. Wii game. The game also now gives the 20 save slots from Shop to You Drop. And now you select your desired mode before a save slot, so Infinity Mode and Overtime Mode, once unlocked, can be started from level 1 if you're interested. They also turned all the load zones into doors for convenience sake, and vehicles can be taken through them if the door is big enough. These are all good. One change I'm let down with a bit is the ability to fast forward time, but not for the reasons you might think. I was excited when the feature was first announced because I was thinking of all the ways it could really optimize perfect runs, which is how I enjoy playing Dead Rising. But they changed it from that reveal trailer. In the footage they showed, time could be fast-forwarded at any location from Frank's watch. But in the final release, it can only be done from safe zones, and only then after enough story progress had been made. It still helps in the infinity mode, even if you can't improvise as many safe locations as you might like. But the only time I found it useful in the main game was skipping past the special forces once I got any achievements from them I was interested in. It was not the optimization tool I was hoping for. In fact, I'm concerned that this might discourage new players from exploring the mall during their downtime, causing them to miss out on new weapons or secret survivor spawns. The new feature I was most let down in was the heavy weapons being able to absorb attacks from the front. Now, the feature is implemented as advertised, and I was surprised with how generous the game considers an attack from the front to be. No, my disappointment is that I just never found it all that helpful. Part of it is because they didn't bring back the iron grip from off the record in Dead Rising 3. In those games, heavy weapons weren't dropped from literally every attack. Just grapples and things that knock the player off their feet like an explosion. The bigger cause of my disappointment is that I just seldom found a reason to use it. Against zombies, it actually became a detriment, because blocking the zombie slaps would wear the weapon down before I had a chance to use it. Carlito's first round has him being far less aggressive than he used to be, so just letting him land a few shots and returning fire was far more effective. This is doubly true for Cletus, as he is a shell of his former self, and the rotating stands actually break faster, blocking damage when held, than when placed down on the ground like in the original game. A bit of extra testing revealed the Parasol was pretty good at blocking damage against the snipers for closing that initial distance, and some funny results came from holding a wine case between me and Steven. But the Special Forces, where this would be the most useful, proved to be where it was the most useless, as their machine guns would just chew through anything I held, and if I didn't have the aid of a book, it would break in as little as two or three bursts. And if a single soldier flanks you, you're dropping your shield while surrounded by a firing squad. While I understand the balance of what the heavy weapons as shields was going for, it just makes it hard to get anything done with them. Weapons that can be good as actual weapons with durability and damage break quickly when they block any attacks, ironically making them worse than their OG versions in most boss fights. Weapons that can absorb a decent amount of damage, on the other hand, are too fragile or weak to be used as an actual weapon, 
so their inability to pocket them becomes a much bigger downside than it used to be. You either have to give them up after a single encounter with the boss, or try to dance around them and hit the boss while they're vulnerable. And if the boss doesn't die from your attack, which is very likely in this version, picking it back up both leaves you wide open to attack half the time, while not being easy to do without the boss destroying the weapon. It makes me wish they just added proper shields like Case West did. The feature shows some promise should the franchise continue, and players willing to use books to buff the durability will probably get more out of the makeshift shields than I did. But when the gameplay trailer showcased the feature, I think it's worth mentioning they cherry-picked it. The barrel has the best durability when held, while the MP5 has the lowest item damage out of any boss attack in the game. The feature isn't useless, but it is not the absolute game-changer it was made out to be. Okay, back to the new stuff. Otis's calls are fully voiced as are the survivor dialogue, but now his calls are completely hands-free. The animation still plays, but Frank can interrupt it to attack, swap weapons, or even get attacked. The call will continue regardless, and the dialogue can be skipped. The only way to interrupt the call and get reprimanded is to interact with a different NPC or start a cutscene. And between the new dialogue of Frank apologizing to Otis when he interrupts him, and that Otis's voice actor does not sound as mad as the text would have you believe, I get the feeling they really wanted people to like Otis this time. As an Otis stan, I approve. On that subject, heavy weapons are no longer dropped when Frank accesses any of his gadgets. This includes not only the walkie-talkie, but also his watch and his camera. I imagine this was mostly for heavy weapons as a shield, but where I found it most useful was with the chainsaw and the heavy machine gun. Being able to answer Otis without having to re-rev the tree slicer was a small but welcome addition. There are some new features for the camera. By default, you can now tilt the camera side to side for different angles, and the battery has been increased to last for 100 uses. On top of that, there are some additional parts you can find in the mall. The ability for a flash feature, to adjust the lighting manually for any given shot, and finally the ability to adjust the focus. I'm pretty impartial to the camera system in this franchise. I like it when Frank's playable, but Dead Rising plays fine without it. I don't mind these additions, though I have a feeling if you're somebody who just likes to mess around with the camera, you'll get the most out of them, because there's no mechanical demand for the new parts. I do have two gripes, however. The first is an issue I have as a Dead Rising veteran. I do not like the camera having nearly infinite battery in the first Dead Rising. I get why Off the Record and 4 dropped the battery feature with the larger map size, but between the fairly small size of the Parkview Mall and the lack of combo weapons, Demanding the player to pick when they use their camera to level up is fair. And that's the thing, the camera isn't this funny little extra like Kingdom Hearts 3, or a tertiary mechanic like some Zelda games, but is Frank's only organic way of leveling up. This isn't accessibility, this is dumbing down a system. And from the more casual angle, why are the extra parts playthrough specific key items? Why not just make them a default part of the camera and have Kent teach the player how to use them during his tutorial? Or, do what Dead Rising 4 did, and make the camera parts rewards for achievements. I know it doesn't take long to get the parts if you want them, but it seems like a really backwards mindset for a feature that's meant to appeal to Dead Rising's more casual side. I definitely would have preferred the camera shops to instead have more books relating to the camera instead. In fact, if we need to increase the battery life of the camera, have a book that triples your battery life when held. Put it in Wonderland Plaza's camera shop. And that brings us to the biggest new additions, the books. I made a video going over the books individually, so I'll just focus on the stronger additions real quick. A recycling book that makes cardboard boxes drop their best items, wine, skateboards, katanas, along with stuff they normally can't drop, shotguns, chainsaws, battle axes. A book that unlocks every skill move for Frank regardless of his level, and becomes a second issue of wrestling once Frank maxes out. A book that puts the game into slow-mo when taking pictures, making it safer to get photo ops of bosses. While not all the books are winners, and in fact one of them doesn't even work properly, these are the best additions gameplay-wise. This sadly is a knock against the rocket launcher. It, make no mistake, it was fun to use. Give a man a means to blow stuff up and fun will be had. And as a longtime Dead Rising fan, it's really novel to see the rocket launcher realized in a believable manner. But that same longtime Dead Rising fan has to admit this is probably the weakest rocket launcher in the series. Not in terms of damage, in fact it's a decent boss killer on New Game Plus, but it's basically locked to New Game Plus. 
Its rate of fire is among the worst of any firearms in the series, and you only get three shots. The blast radius is pretty small too, smaller than the graphic would have you believe. Meaning that unless enemies are incredibly bunched together, using up a third of its ammo results in a disappointing amount of deletion. Sure, it's utterly broken when using the infinite durability book, but that speaks more to how overpowered removing ammo and durability is, rather than an appraisal to the rocket launcher. Especially compared to the Ratchet and Clank worthy rocket launcher from Dead Rising 2. And at least in Dead Rising 3 or 4, the RPG was available more or less right away. And that's it. Okay, that's not literally it. There are several alterations this review will go over, and there are smaller additions like the clothing locker from Dead Rising 3 being brought in. But in terms of the fully new stuff that can affect the gameplay, these are the big ones. And I have to be honest, I'm disappointed. While the quality of life improvements are nice, I was able to enjoy the first game without them. And so, the new stuff amounts to having two new features, neither of which are as helpful as advertised to a suspicious degree, a new weapon basically locked to New Game Plus, and a series of books. It's a fairly meager offering, especially when compared to Off the Record, which included a whole new zone to explore, new food items and weapons, new costumes, which this game does not do beyond DLC, new survivors, new psychopaths, actual Frank West, and sandbox mode, all with no more than a year's development time at max. Most, if not all, the work being done after Kenji and Afune left Capcom, and released for only $40. Now sure, off the record didn't have to switch gameplay engines, but neither did Deluxe Remaster. They could have gotten thrifty and tried to look for a studio that knew how to work with the Havoc engine and the existing MT framework, or they could have just elected to make a new game on the Resident Evil engine. There's a lot of things I was let down to not see. Some are from the beta. The fire extinguisher was originally a melee weapon where the ranged mode used the foam attack, and that would have been a lot more useful than what we got in the final release of both versions. And there's an unused model for what appears to be a flamethrower in the original game's files. But my real letdown here are simple things from Dead Rising 2 that were not added, and I do not mean the combo weapons. Things like proper distraction items, handheld explosives not locked to endgame, and elemental damage are still stuck in the future... er... past entries? How do I qualify that here? Also, for some reason the map is littered with things you can't interact with at all. This kind of static set dressing is fine for something like Resident Evil, but Dead Rising's motto was, anything and everything is a weapon. It gets real distracting when these new static props were actually weapons back in the Blue Castle Studio era, and that there are weapon animations in the first Dead Rising that could have been used for them. I also remember when Dead Rising 4 was criticized for being all props with no interaction, 
I wonder why that was rarely brought up this time. To end this section off, I want to address something I was asked in my video on the new books. Why would I want more niche durability books, like a book for cooking items or police equipment, when there's an infinite durability book? Well, I prefer playing Dead Rising starting from level 1. Yes, I'm level 50 in most of the videos I've uploaded, but that's for the ease of recording. When I'm playing for fun, I start back at 1. I also find the durability mechanic to be what makes Dead Rising fun, as it constantly forces me to switch weapons or be clever with my inventory. And I would like to increase the durability of more items through books without nullifying the mechanic. And come on, you're gonna let the player drive the motorcycle all across the mall but not give them a book to triple its durability? Weird for controls to be this late in the review, I know, but I wanted to wait until transitioning into the gameplay proper to bring it up. I chose to go with the new control scheme to see how it feels. And honestly, it wasn't too bad. Using the D-pad to swap weapons was not nearly the awful layout I feared it would be from the trailers. That said, I will definitely be taking advantage of the ability to remap buttons should I revisit this game after this review. I do think a better default control scheme could have been used, the game for some reason doesn't have any use to the left trigger, and it seems to default to a second attack button, but there's no difference from the X button, it just has two buttons that let you do the same attack. The fact that the dodge roll is now mapped to a face button by default, however, was a massive red flag, but we'll get to that later. While the control scheme itself is fine, the actual controls did not get out unscathed. Now, in the broad strokes, the game does a good job of mimicking the original's play and feel, if you only play Dead Rising occasionally or casually, you won't notice any major differences in how the game controls. That's quite commendable. The fact that Frank doesn't snap between animations, however, will get on some longtime player's nerves. This means that the player can't jump around or turn on a dime quite like you could in the OG game, giving the movement a more stiff feeling. The worst offender of this is aim mode, as Frank now has to actually transition into the attack animation, which adds a slight delay between entering aim mode and being allowed to attack. This will make a certain part of the game a nightmare. The skill moves have different timing to them. This isn't actually a bad thing, it's just an adjustment. The somersault kick is easier to pull off, but you'll have to wait until the apex of your jump to perform the jump kick, wall kick, or knee drop now. Thankfully, between the skill move button from Dead Rising 2 being brought over, and Shop to You Drop's skill prompts for downed zombies, they are, across the board, way easier to pull off, and more consistent to do so. The only control issue with them is that the wall kick requires pressing towards the wall instead of away from it, making it hard to actually aim the attack like you used to be able to. So, the controls themselves do a good job of mimicking the basics of Dead Rising 1, and skill moves are much easier to pull off in this version, but some smaller details got lost in the process. Moving on to the mall, I want to revisit an idea I mentioned. A lack of something new. I'm happy the mall is faithful to its original layout, but disappointed that there was no expansion to it. There is simply nothing new to find in this revisit to Willamette, right down to no new secret item locations. For example, it's not like they replaced some of the copy-paste stores with new ones to help give the entrance plaza more variety. It's not like they added a store to some of the barren walls of Alfresca Plaza. And they didn't have any of the stores in North Plaza be further along in development for some item and visual variety. Of course, a different and perhaps better way to expand the mall is to add more interactivity. Something that makes Fortune City the best location in the franchise to this day is the level of interaction every area has. Even if you ignore the slot machines and choose not to play the minigames, the knowledge of its interactive nature makes the casino feel alive, despite being populated by the dead. A part of it is the money system for sure, but I also think the lack of a camera forced them to add those extra interactions. When you can't rely on 100pp stickers to level up, you gotta get creative. Sadly, as I said earlier, everything added to the map is strictly static cosmetics. The vending machines have no snacks or sodas to offer, the balloons in Wonderland Plaza can't be popped for a PP bonus, you won't find any test your strength events in the mall, you still can't vandalize or remove the raincoat cult posters, no putting out the burning barrels in the movie theater. No nothing. If the mall bored you or left you underwhelmed back in 2006, 
its 2024 version has little more to offer other than some shoe shine. Instead of adding more means to gank PP in the mall, they elected instead to just increase how much prestige points you get from the environment. And you know what, that was in order, even if there were new PP interactions added. The environmental bonuses fell off way too quickly in the original in terms of leveling up, like it became fairly useless as soon as Frank hit level 20. However, they grossly overcompensated. All environmental bonuses now earn 3 to 5 times what they used to, with PP stickers now giving 5,000 PP for a perfect shot instead of 1,000. Combine that with drastically lower requirements for leveling up in the early game, and the game starts to break if you have any memory of the original. Let me give a demonstration of how much this breaks the leveling system. I played through the game the first time as I would the original, just to see how natural it was. I have most of the PP stickers in Paradise Plaza and the Food Court down pat, to squeeze a few levels out of the early game when they matter most. With the aid of the photo and survivor books, I'm usually level 7 to 8 after beating Carlito in the original, and about 13 to 15 after defeating Adam. In the remake, I'm level 2 before I touch down on the rooftop, I'm level 5 before the security room is sealed shut, I'm level 9 before I reach Paradise Plaza, and foregoing the photo books when I gain access to them because I realize how stupid the prestige points now are. I was level 15 before I beat Carlito, and using only the Survivor PP book, I was level 20 when I fought Adam. To spare you the full play-by-play, -play, I reached level 50 in the OG game, either right before or right after the Special Forces arrive, depending on how liberally I used my camera that playthrough. When I reached max level in the remake, Brad was still alive. They should have just doubled the environmental prestige point bonuses and buffed the books that give you more PP from activities. Doing that while keeping the original level up requirements, which were just fine, would have given new players an edge without completely screwing up the pacing of leveling up for longtime players. Getting the first 15 levels in the first two hours is a contributing factor to leveling ups not feeling all that impactful in this version. This being so heavily defended when Dead Rising 3 was raked over the coals for its broken leveling up system is really infuriating. On the subject of leveling up not feeling impactful, the speed stat. Yeah, Frank's default movement speed was jacked up in this port. His max speed is left untouched, so instead the benefits from speed upgrades have been lowered. Given you only have three speed upgrades across all 50 levels, it can be very easy to not notice or feel the benefits of moving faster in this version. Some say this was for the convenience of moving faster or around zombies at low levels, but if that's the case, why did they need to trivialize leveling up early on by doing things like making it so the 50 zombie kill bonuses now give 3,000 prestige points? Speaking of zombies, that is something they did add to them all. Cop zombies can now use their guns. It's a cute detail. For an hour or two. But the more I played this remake, the more I started to realize why this was left on the cutting room floor. It's annoying to have pepper spray make you drop heavy items or stagger you when you try to move around a zombie without getting grappled. These guys work and shop to you drop because of the stop and go nature of the gameplay. It gives Frank a much needed mid-range enemy for the RE4 style of gameplay. They worked in Dead Rising 3 because Nick doesn't properly stagger from gunfire, and guns being more common, allows them to upgrade the shotgun cops later in the game, along with military variants with ARs. Here, they're just a mild nuisance. Actually, mild nuisance is the best way to describe the horde as a whole. Part of it is the smaller numbers for sure. The giant swing and double lariat feel almost useless, when the somersault kick, which can now hit multiple enemies, and the roundhouse kick can deal with almost every zombie threat level in the game. But the Horde's small size is largely the game not being smart about when it spawns and despawns zombies compared to the original. For example, the maintenance tunnels can match the original Zed count if you stick to one section of it, but the zombie count will struggle to keep up with you if you properly explore the whole thing like you're intended to. No no no, the true culprit is that the Horde is very passive, to the point of not responding half the time. It is not uncommon for a zombie to not respond to the player's presence, even if standing right beside them. Frank and the survivors can just run past several hordes relatively risk-free, even without any queens, and often get by without a single grapple, sometimes not even a scratch. This one-two punch of the lower zombie count 
and the few zombies being there not being very interested, even at nighttime when they're meant to go berserk, makes the main threat of the game lack much of a presence, both physically and mechanically. And finally, no extra zombie types were added into this game. You won't be seeing any waitress zombies at Jill's Sandwiches, nor any baristas at the various coffee shops. You will not see zombified members of the Special Forces when they invade the mall. The remains of the Willamette Fire Department did not make their way into the Parkview Mall in this version either. That last one is tragic, given how the fire racks could only be found in a single location in the mall, and having zombies wield it would have been a welcome addition. And most bizarrely, the construction worker zombies that are immune to headshots are nowhere to be found. The mall, and the zombies that populate it, have seen no changes down to a fault, and have nothing of note to discover that the original game did not. Instead, most of the attention has gone to making the level-up system as overly generous as possible, solely to the benefit of newer casual players, with those more familiar with the game having nothing to sink their teeth into, and if anything, now breeze through the game on their first run. On to weapons and balance, one of the most talked about aspects of this remake. First up is the small chainsaw, getting a very well-deserved nerf to its damage output. The weapon is now among the weakest of the boss drops. With nighttime zombies being able to survive a swing if Frank is a low level, and it's only an arm instead of their head that gets taken out. It can still be triple booked for its ridiculous durability, but it will not instantly melt a boss in 4 seconds. This, as far as I'm concerned, is a good thing. The regular chainsaw also got a much-needed buff. It's just a simple increase to its durability, but it now lasts for about a good 50 or so hits without the aid of a book. I also think it's had a slight buff to its damage, but I can't quite tell, even with direct comparisons. Regardless, this alone is enough for me to say that this is the best chainsaw in the series. Just running through the horde or defeating a psychopath like a mad woodsman was easily the most fun I had in this remake. Weapon durability being buffed is a bit of a trend. Nothing else has been buffed to the degree of the chainsaw, but several weapons that had 20 hits of durability now have 30 to 40. This is also fine, as it gives improvised weapons more utility, while keeping them fragile enough to greatly benefit from and still need books. Unlike the PP books, which were made largely unnecessary. Weapons have also all gotten a durability meter. That's the blue bar below them, in case you were curious. Finally, weapons like cooking oil or the perfume prop drop a bit of liquid when hit, allowing players to trip zombies up without having to destroy the weapon entirely. This is sadly hampered by the lower zombie count and less aggressive AI, but it's still a nice addition. So yeah, there are some really good balance changes in this game. Now let's talk about everything they messed up. Damage is utterly broken in this version. Frank's bare fists at level 1 in the remake are now as good as they used to be at level 50 with wrestling in the OG game. But they barely benefit from any attack upgrades now. While female zombies can now be one shot at level 50, all of the other zombie types still need 2 to 3 hits instead of 3 to 5. But despite there now being two unarmed combat books, it barely moves the needle, as only thin male zombies can go down in one hit when you have both. For any other zombie type, it makes no difference. I can't tell if it's the contradictory goal of making it so unarmed combat is viable for everyone regardless of playstyle, or if it's just something literally not working properly. Speaking of which, throwing weapons in DRDR just don't work. Period. First, their rate of fire is as bad as it was as Dead Rising 3 and 4, minus the part where the fandom called it out as a problem. So the DPS for all of them is terrible. Except wait, most of them can't even do any real damage per hit at all. The plates in Dead Rising 1 could defeat Carlito in a single stack. Now an entire stack, at best, will maybe take half a health bar. Soda cans at level 50 could kill any zombie during the day, but now? Oh, and the instant kill headshots at max throw doesn't work half the time, so gems have lost the only thing they're good for. Many DR1 fans criticized Dead Rising 2 for weakening the throwing weapons for what was assumed to make combo weapons more useful, yet I seem to be the only person willing to ask if this game did the same thing for the new throwing books they added. 
Shopping carts and the weapons cart are now actually useless. There's a delay for their movement to even kick in, they're now slower than Frank's default movement speed, and they somehow manage to be very stiff while having miserable drift. If Dead Rising 3's vehicles making the shopping carts redundant was worthy of criticism, Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster making them damn near unusable should warrant a scolding as well. Hipfire is borked as well. The handgun, SMG, and machine gun now all suffer from pretty bad bullet spread when not in aim mode, even if Frank is standing perfectly still. The shotgun's pellet spread is so bad that a third of its pellets will just fly into the floor half the time. And when using an automatic weapon, if the game at any point actually spawns a zombie in the map itself, which this version is very prone to doing, Frank will develop scoliosis and try to shoot a zombie through the floor. While entering aim mode doesn't have any of these issues, Remember that there were times when Hipfire was just faster in the OG, and now there's a delay between entering aim mode and being able to attack. While Dead Rising 3 had this problem, it wasn't as drastic. Body shot damage was generally better, and guns were more expendable. The bench and baseball bat have new attacks. The bench's new attack is fine, it's trading the extra reach for more reliable crowd control, but the bat is now just a much slower version of the same thing, with a lot more wind-up, leaving Frank open for attack. It turns what was previously one of his safest and most reliable weapons into one of his weakest and clunkiest options. And it's not any stronger, either. Actually, attacks across the board are just slower in this version. It's not that bad with the knives or the guitars, but they're about the only weapons that got out unscathed. Swords already had blind spots where zombies could grapple Frank in the OG game, but between their slower attacks and zombie hitboxes being funky at best, they're relegated exclusively to psychopath weapons. Spear attacks, like the broken broomstick or the heavy attack for the laser sword, have so much lag that you now need to time your attacks to follow them up. Otherwise, Frank has to now wait for his animation to reset to poke again. The fire extinguisher got hit really bad. This one is tragic because they actually did buff this weapon. It has both more durability and the hitbox of its foam is way more generous. But there's so much starting and ending lag to this one that you have to use it and end the attack preemptively if you don't want to get hit. It's somehow even more niche than it was in the original game. I could go on with little things like this, but I think you get the idea. Cardboard boxes are now more annoying than ever to open. Jumping on them no longer opens them and just pushes them or Frank out of the way. Frank has to be careful when opening them using the kick because of the extra ending lag to the end. This means the kick remains active long enough to damage or even destroy the contents of the box. Like if it's a wine bottle or a cleaver. This is doubly true for the knee drop, which has the shockwave from off the record, but it doesn't actually measure the player's drop distance, so you always get the shockwave, and it will destroy anything near the box, and I have had it destroy what's inside. The only safe way is to manually throw them with the aim assist mode in its delay, or to deteriorate weapons slash use up ammo to open them. All of the explosions are less effective. Yeah, plot twist, it's not exclusive to the rocket launcher. They all have a far smaller hitbox than they used to, with a single propane tank going from always clearing out 20 plus zombies, to, if you're lucky, breaking into the double digits. And if you thought the Molotov cocktail wasn't useful before, well, this'll do nothing to change your mind. And finally, the real Mega Buster has been Mega Busted. Its rate of fire has been lowered down to what feels like a third of its original, just so they can give it a worthless charge shot. Why is it worthless? Let me count the ways! First, in the time it takes to fully charge a shot with the new Mega Buster, Frank could have easily fired off six shots with the OG Buster, enough to kill any enemy in the game. Second, the max charge shot only does 80% extra damage. So, charging up to the best blast won't even reward double damage for the time it takes. Okay, maybe it's meant to deal with zombies. It does get penetration on charge shots and they do explode. And while both are true, the charge shot breaks apart after only hitting five or so zombies. It doesn't penetrate indefinitely, and the blast radius can't even cover the entirety of the elevator to the rooftop. Oh, and the charge shots can be blocked by the level geometry, so there's even more possible uses out the window. The Mega Buster is the single most botched thing in this remake, and it turned the best unlockable in the franchise into something I found less useful than the Zero Exosuit in Dead Rising 4. This honestly isn't even an exhaustive list of all the little problems weapons have, but uh, you, you get the idea. 
For all of the nice balance changes there are, there are very questionable ones and several little differences that make a lot of weapons downgrades at best and dysfunctional at worst. Alright, survivors, the talk of the town, well, of those not walking corpses yet, they fixed the survivor AI, right? They fixed the survivor AI, right? So, here's the scoop. The survivor AI's pathfinding is shockingly unchanged from the original game, and many of the same quirks like getting stuck on each other, needing to visit Frank before going to a waypoint, or taking very unoptimal routes are still present. But there are improvements. They don't have as linear of a sense of direction, making it easier for them to get over things that require a jump, like the gun store counter. Other places that used to require a jump, like the artificial river or the rooftop vent, are now ramps for them to simply go up. And their shoves deal massive item damage, meaning that they can just destroy anything they get stuck on. Though it sucks if you intended to use that item. However, what makes them much easier to save, above all else, is again the zombie AI. The undead just aren't that hungry this time around, often ignoring survivors entirely even during nighttime sections. Couple that with the smaller numbers, and survivors can basically be ignored if there's no cultist or convicts around. This isn't actually a bad thing in and of itself, Dead Rising 2 survivors are pretty comparable to that, but it did come at a cost. You see, in the original game, some survivors were very combat efficient, to the point where when given a gun, they would level entire hordes and help escort you. The survivor button was more than just calling them to your location, it was a call to action. If they were far from Frank, they'd make their way towards him. If they were nearby, they'd get violent and attack any nearby zombies or enemies. Or get pissed at Frank if he just yelled at them for no reason. This created a slow and steady method of getting survivors across the mall, with unique situations like Tanya or Kendall, where they would help escort you while you attended to a crippled survivor. These missions are still in the game, but those original purposes simply don't work anymore. The hand-holding for traumatized women is rendered redundant for similar reasons, aside from Susan, since she still gets tired. So, when I say that part of me prefers survivors in the OG, it's not that the AI being mentally disabled made them more satisfying to save. That is a stupid argument that I cannot believe people unironically make. It's that it lost this unique dynamic that helped Dead Rising 1 stand out from its otherwise superior follow-up. Part of the reason the survivors aren't quite as combat efficient with guns this time around is the new survivor affinity system. Survivors now have favorite food items and weapons, assuming they're combat capable with the latter. Their favorite food items will fully heal them, no matter its healing value, while their favorite weapon will get a damage boost from them, and both will increase their favor with Frank. Increasing affinity also prevents defection from attacks. Survivors will slowly favor Frank over time, with manually escorted survivors warming up faster. The idea of the system isn't a bad one, and allowing more reckless players to prevent survivors from defecting is good. Giving survivors weapons that they can be exceptionally effective with can result in some interesting bits, like one of the Japanese tourists specializing with the toy laser sword. But as I said, it's also why survivors aren't that combat effective in the first place. You have to now go through this system to get them to that state. And if you aren't giving them their at most two favorite weapons, then you're going through the extra steps just to achieve what the original game had most of them capable of. The higher affinity also overrides survivor traits, as survivors are no longer tethered to each other outside of Tanya and Ross. And cowardly survivors may as well be a cosmetic detail. I doubt there will be many tears shed over this, but it does remove more of that individuality they mechanically had. However, what I actually hate about this system is how blind it is to the gameplay. Jeff will instantly become happy with Frank if he's given an apple, but reuniting him with his wife Natalie doesn't move the needle at all. Both will be grumpy with you. You can rescue all of Joe's hostages from her assault, but they won't be satisfied with Frank until he gives them their cake and melons. And the laid-back Susan thanking Frank for being her personal escort still has the grumpy affinity when joining the party. Nothing that happens in the missions themselves is factored into the system, resulting in the survivors feeling less like characters and more like gameplay mechanics. A damn shame, since the series has truly memorable NPCs, despite how little dialogue they get. They also gave survivors banter when escorting them. Once you get high affinity with any given character, they'll start spouting some generic lines and advice shared amongst all of them. And I hate it. 
Oh, if I don't like the affinity system creating a disconnect between the survivors and their stories, I am definitely not approving of the survivors going fish-eyed and giving advice that would be considered laughable on loading screens. There's these rooms and rainforests going around to kidnap the people. As if things weren't bad enough. Son of a if you bitch. run into anyone who has trouble moving, you should give them a hand. I owe you one. I saw someone just binging on a bunch of booze. I guess I get Follow it me! in circumstances. <sighs> okay, calming down for a moment. Let's break this down. There is no reason for survivors to give advice they do, even from a gameplay standpoint. There is no reason for them to point out PP stickers, because the game has an entire menu devoted to them, giving you a picture of the sticker and the part of the mall it's in. It is reasonable to expect players to be able to find them on their own with that information. There is no reason to point out hidden weapons, because those should be a reward for players who explore off the beaten path, not to reward players who realize Bill likes pie. There's no reason to inform players about the hidden missions, since most of them are already designed for the player to not need to know about their existence. All of them, aside from the gunshop trio, coincide with other existing side missions, or they're placed in very convenient locations. They're designed to catch the player by surprise, instead of being hard to find. There's no reason for them to give the various gameplay tips, as between Paradise Plaza having everything they talk about and Otis contacting you throughout all of Case 1, you can pretty much figure all of that out yourself. And their mixed drink recommendations are worthless because, like the already existing menus at the various blenders, they don't tell you how to make any of them. They couldn't even make this banter be character specific so it could make at least some sense. Like, having Kendall reference Gil's existence would make sense given how close their missions are to each other. But the Japanese tourists are a good 24 in-game hours away from Gil's mission, so them informing the player about some drunk in the mall will just send them out on a fruitless search, the opposite of helping. It's even possible for secret survivors to alert Frank to their own mission's existence. There's a gun shop in the North Plaza. I think we could do with some firearms right about now. And there's the lovely immersion-shattering breaks in characters I showcased during the censorship section. Honestly, I ended up keeping the survivor affinity low for most of the characters just to shut them up. And a big reason I'm harping on this for so long is that it is such a modern-day gaming problem. The need to make every aspect of the game achievable for lowest common denominator engagement is so bad that we can't even have secret weapons or hidden events anymore. Even giving the player a devoted menu to show you where the now glow-in-the-dark PP stickers are isn't enough, I guess. We need to have a feature where it points out their exact location, with a massive blinking dot on screen, and then marking it on your map. Same for any given secret weapon. Immersion, both its importance and its breaking point, is subjective from person to person. But how is it that, in the age of the internet, rather than having hidden objects and events and encouraging players to share their discoveries with each other, like a community, games nowadays are more determined than ever, to never require outside help, regardless of how forced, distracting, or unnatural the guidance they come up with is achieved. If they wanted to help players with these things, there are better and more subtle ways to do so. For weapon tips, just make achievements for them. Instead of having survivors mention that you can ride a skateboard, make an achievement for riding a skateboard a certain distance in one uninterrupted go. This both tells the player that they can use skateboards like skateboards, and that they can potentially be knocked off it before the players even picked one up. Have an achievement for finding all the SMGs, which would indicate to the player that they're not going to be in an obvious spot. You know, stuff like that. Moving on to the secret missions, the Gunshop Trio are the only ones that could use some adjustments since the rest have reasonable clues or are just painfully obvious. And the fix is pretty easy. Extend their deadline. The mission currently expires at 5pm on Day 3, right when Case 8 begins. So if we move that deadline to 9pm, this would give the player a chance to grab them on their way back from the hideout to the security room when they're about to learn about Larry. And since the hideout is literally right next to the gun store, a player wanting to stock up will at least organically learn about their existence. There's several little changes like that I could propose for survivor missions, but at that point we're getting to a whole other video idea. So for now, why is the 8 survivor rule still a thing? Dead Rising 1, 2, and Off the Record has a program rule where only 8 survivors can be active in the mall at once. 
This is to prevent the AI from breaking outright, as Stippo showed in his video where he removed the limit. If a mission that you knew was marked never activated for you in Dead Rising, it was probably because this limit was hit. So tell me, why is Dead Rising 1 rebuilt from modern hardware still held to the same limitation of an Xbox 360 game? Or why was it at least not increased to 10 or 12? That would have helped make it more flexible for a lot of new players with how you escort survivors, and prevent missions not activating because of a rule the players are never informed of. Alright, so to recap, while the improved AI is appreciated, it came at the cost of the original's unique dynamics that helped it stand out from Dead Rising 2, while not removing, or at least adjusting, a truly outdated mechanic. The affinity system shows promise, but its implementation ranges from a marginal improvement at best, to cumbersome at worst. The knowledge that they censored this game in the name of sensitivity, while introducing some of the most tone-deaf dialogue since Vic Chu, is outright infuriating. Psychopaths feature the same combat style and movesets as they did in the original, but most of them have modifications to them. Some are more impactful than others, and I would love to go through them one by one, but this review has already gone on long enough, and not all of the changes are a big deal. So instead, I'll go over any of the bosses with massive reworks, then cover the three most consistent changes across the bosses, and the notable examples. The convicts actually function as a boss now, capable of properly navigating the park, and the gunner will disengage if Frank is far enough away, or if the convicts are on the retreat. They will also take minor damage if they crash into something. This actually makes them much harder to approach with melee weapons than they used to be. Adam the Clown now has three colors of balloons instead of four, but each one has different qualities. The red balloon is unchanged, the blue balloon fills and launches almost instantly, and the green balloon actually heals anyone hit by it for a block of health. Snipers now have a laser sight to let the player know who's being targeted. On top of that, the Hall family have been drastically overhauled. There is no longer any discrepancy in their aim, but Thomas will refuse to shoot the player during story mode, while Roger will eventually tire out trying to run away. Finally, Brock has had QTEs added to his battle, based on the ones from Chop to You Drop. Now for the larger changes. First is that boss attacks have had their attack durations stretched out, resulting in slower attacks. I know that's a weird way to word that, but I promise there's a reason. Regardless, it's one of the biggest reasons people say this version is easier. Many bosses just take longer to attack now, which also makes their attacks ironically easier to walk away from if the boss is stationary. Almost all of Adam's attacks are stretched out long enough to leave him wide open for attacks, Joe Slade spends half the boss fight walking towards Frank, and can't use her stun gun without giving you a two weeks notice. And Cletus? Man. Cletus went from being a terrible boss because he's a spamming bastard where luck determines if you die in 10 seconds, to a terrible boss because it takes him 10 seconds to unleash a single magazine of his shotgun. Seriously, his entire fight now feels like it's in slow motion. The second is that bosses will gain damage resistance if the player attacks them too much. Yes, this absolute hernia of a mechanic from Off the Record Returns. I get why it was added, some weapons or tactics give bosses the life expectancy of Concord, but it doesn't make it any less cheap when the game wiggles its finger at the player and tells them to play fair against bosses that often have no such restriction. Joe and Paul's fights can really drag on with their massive health bars now, and Steven specifically will sometimes become invincible after getting hit, and then gets his damage resistance for a while. To pause this segment for a moment, this is a problem a lot of people have had with this remake, but haven't been able to put to words. This game is somehow both way easier than the original, while almost nothing works as well as it used to. So, it's not providing nearly as good of a challenge as the original game did, but it's also not nearly as gratifying as a power fantasy either. Getting back on track, the final change to the bosses across the board is my least favorite in the whole game, uh, behind the Mega Buster. Hostile enemies can now track Frank's movement through their entire attack. If you don't know what this phenomenon is, please watch this snippet from an ancient review of Dark Souls 2. Attacks also lock on to an unnecessary degree, far more than in previous installments where enemies usually had movesets with their own weaknesses and strengths. When a boss goes to do an overhead attack, it will usually track the player up until the very last moment before impact, 
even if this means the boss has to spin around like they're standing on top of a record player. I can only speak for myself, but I was hoping to see less of this kind of stuff, not more. Bosses should have movesets which don't rely on tracking the player in such a cheap, simplistic way, and it's notable that big bosses in Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 1 usually lack this kind of lock-on, or only used it during part of the wind-up in order to compensate for their powerful moves. This is why the dodge roll being mapped to a face button was a red flag for me. This isn't just a Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster problem, this is something I just hate about modern video game combat. And I'll spare you my soapbox and just say, I miss when the dodge maneuver was an emergency tool for when positioning failed you, instead of a requirement because half of the boss's attacks are homing missiles. As for how it negatively affects this game, the convicts and Isabella can make tighter turns even more easily to run you over. All enemy snipers will stay on target up to the point of firing, and they have larger hitboxes for their bullets, so strafing is now near impossible. Joe's stun gun attack can follow the player relative to her direction, so getting behind her even with a dodge roll is unnecessarily frustrating, and because of how slow and drawn out the move is, there will be times where you get behind her, turn around the hitter, and get stunned. Not every boss is horrid with tracking like this, in fact Sean has a shocking amount of restraint for his moves. But it feels cheap when an attack hits you because they lean into your movement when you would have otherwise been out of the way. Despite all of this, I'd actually say bosses are comparatively unscathed as far as the gameplay goes. Uh, sure, I'd say some of them definitely got it better than others did. But they're still the highlight of this game as they were in the original. This falls more into the section of things that deserve to be talked about instead of things that greatly ruin the experience. With one major exception. Ah, Frankie! Good timing! Yeah, you wouldn't expect Kent, of all bosses, to be the one they screwed up, but everything I brought up here comes together to make an awful experience. Because they altered the attack duration instead of the attack speed, his jump kick and head first shove go much further than they used to be able to. The extra damage resistance completely screws with the balance of his fight. As he's supposed to be a glass cannon, somebody who can deal a lot of damage but dies very quickly, but now he has effectively 50 to 75% more health while still being very fast and having attacks for all ranges. But it's the tracking that ruins his fight. His head forward shove deals two blocks of damage, goes on nearly twice as long as it used to, and tracks so badly that he can do a 180 mid attack to hit you after you dodge roll past him. In the original game, this move was a way for him to force Frank off of him and make some distance, but now it's basically an unavoidable two blocks of damage. I died a couple times to the convicts and the Hall family trying to learn their new dynamics, but I died to Kent at least eight times solely because the shove move was, well, unavoidable. Were heavy weapons supposed to knock him over when he charged into them and they just forgot to program that in? Both Overtime and Infinity Mode have seen some changes from their original incarnation. For Overtime Mode, there is one very big issue plaguing it. The Special Forces Gunfire no longer grants Frank Super Armor when he's hit. For those who don't know, Super Armor is when you still take damage from an attack in a video game, but you don't stagger or react to it. This was implemented so when Frank got shot by the Spec Ops, he would still have to be wary of them, but would at least have a chance to close the distance or escape if needed, without being wombo comboed. But between that no longer being the case, and the dodge roll always having its full delay between uses, even if it gets interrupted, well, you're gonna get wombo comboed a lot more often. The Spec Ops are way more tedious to deal with in this version, since two or three of them can combo Frank to death. Which is a shame because the Bazooka Troopers are a great addition. For whatever I think of the Rocket Launcher, these guys add the spice that Overtime Mode really needed. They actually function more akin to snipers, trying to make distance from Frank before taking aim. But since their tracking ends before they actually fire a rocket, Frank can sidestep their shots if he's far enough away. This makes dealing with a lot of them a compelling task, as you end up weaving around their sight lines while you try to get to where you need to go, without getting so close to one of them that they swap to their machine guns. The rocket launchers can take out a normal Spec Ops, but they'll need the benefit of gunslingers to take down the more heavily armored Bazooka Troopers. The game even gives them a unique death animation, just to make it clear when it's one of these guys you took down. 
They also gave lasers for the little drone's line of sight, they lowered the amount of queens Isabella needs from 10 to 5, and they made Brock's tank require far less damage to be defeated. Between all of that and the improvements to Brock's battle, this could be a direct upgrade from the OG overtime mode. But only if they ever actually address the special forces being able to stunlock Frank so effortlessly. It pains me to say that a single detail can ruin it like that, but the gun-toting special forces are the main enemy, and so they have the biggest sway on the mode. Which is tragic. The Infinity Mode has seen a major overhaul. The goal is the same, limited healing, constantly depleting health, survive as long as possible. However, zombies can now also drop items if slain, ranging anywhere from a coat hanger to food to a heavy machine gun. Survivor spawn times and loot drops are also randomized, although they will always drop at least some food. Characters can also now respawn indefinitely. The map now gives you an indication when an enemy has spawned in a section of the mall, but it won't tell you the exact store. I am incredibly mixed on this version. On one hand, there's definitely some fun in having to improvise your strategy based on what the game gives you. And there could, at least in theory, be times when you choose to skip out on a boss fight because you're ill-equipped to deal with them. And the ability to both fast-forward time and create a suspend point, uh, think of the quick saves from New Super Mario Bros. Wii, are great additions. But on the other hand, this is a pretty poor replacement for the old version. I have a few videos going over it if you're interested, but the original was a well-structured survival mode, where you were meant to replay it over and over to learn who spawns where, and to improve your time, kind of similar to how you were meant to replay the base game. Now, it's just another RNG-heavy roguelike mode, minus the procedurally generated map. And the random loot means most of the little nods, references, and jokes with survivor inventory are now lost to time. I'd have no issue with this if this was a second version of the mode as an option, but we were robbed of an improved version of the Infinity Mode right as they fixed the issue of having to wait around and do nothing. And that's before the problems with this version get talked about. Namely, the Special Forces spawn in this mode as well now, starting on your third day of survival. And, uh, take a guess what's gonna happen from time to time. The Special Forces, everybody, couldn't kill a single zombified secretary, but single-handedly laid waste to two entire game modes. There's also nothing that you would expect from an actual roguelike mode to make this version more distinct, or to help you out a little. For example, there's nothing like your inventory carrying between your runs, so that way if one goes bad, you can start the next one with an advantage. There's no extra unlockable weapons for this mode. No extra achievements that you can get, like opening 100 loot boxes. They don't even have the leaderboards this time around, like the 360 and Xbox One versions did. Despite the fact that there's no longer a proper ceiling for how long you can survive. Despite the fact that the randomness was almost certainly meant to add a bit of replay value, this version is every bit as much one and done as the original. You know, once you remove that soul-crushing time commitment, which to be clear I do not miss in and of itself, it's hard to ignore how little this mode has to offer. That's probably why they added the special forces in the first place, because otherwise you would die of boredom well before starvation. Achievements are probably a weird topic for a lot of you, but if you're a longtime viewer of this channel, you'll know I think highly of the achievements in Dead Rising. It's just low-key something the series does better than most, with the 360 era having 50 achievements that actually involve the player having to do something or engage with the mechanics, instead of devoting 10 achievements to story progression, and the rest being for 100%ing all of the possible side quests. However, there was a lot of room for updating these. Several achievements were effectively bragging about what the Xbox 360 could do. It can keep track of how many steps you've taken across multiple playthroughs. It can measure the distance of any given fall or jump in a vehicle. It can keep track of how long you're inside or outside. 
impressive stuff for the time, but prime candidates to be replaced in a remake. The same goes for some of the redundant achievements they did have. Did we really need three achievements related to saving survivors, or defeating psychopaths, or even killing zombies? I don't think so. So did they replace them? Eh, kinda. They got rid of the redundant in-between achievements for beating psychopaths and saving survivors, as well as indoorsmen and outdoorsmen. They also condensed Stunt Driver and Stunt Rider into a single achievement. And for some reason, they dropped the achievement for photographing ten bosses and went for the one that only requires four. That's weird. Not as weird as the decision to keep the measurement achievements like walking or falling far enough. Meanwhile, they chopped some of the more interesting challenges the original game had. The gourmet achievement for eating every type of food, when this is the only entry in the series where food can easily rot. Perfect Gunner, thanks to that stupid infinite durability book, this one no longer would work properly. And Unbreakable. Did they find the cult too easy to avoid now that there's a QTE for them? Or did they find their version of the Spec Ops too hard to outlast? And in its place, we have nine new achievements. And four of them are pretty damn worthless. One of them is literally just getting past the rooftop when you land on the mall for the first time. One is for photographing 10 PP stickers. One is for killing 500 zombies in a vehicle, which is guaranteed to happen if you make it to Bomb Collector, so why bother making this an achievement? And one for restarting the game, when there's already an achievement for reaching Day 3, and it gives you a new book for New Game Plus. So again, why bother? As for the other five, there's one for killing 100 cultists, which is fair, I consider it very weird this wasn't in the original game. Flinging a golf ball a very long distance, which I'm fine with, it teaches new players that the golf club is both a melee and a ranged weapon. Find the shortcut between Wonderland and Paradise. I really don't get why this one's needed. There's still an achievement for defeating your first psychopath, which will probably be Adam. And is it really common for people to forget to save Greg? There's one for killing 30 enemies with a rocket launcher. I mean, I guess it is the new weapon, the one true new weapon of this game, but it's a pretty lame replacement for Perfect Gunner. And finally, one for making all seven mixed drinks. Gourmet used to require this and then some, so I consider this a simplified replacement. Finally, some achievements got reworked. I do like the changes to The Artiste and Karate Champ. The former now requires a 10k pick, basically being a perfectly achieved photo opportunity, and the latter is for now defeating 30 special forces with your bare hands. Sadly, any other changes to achievements have just had them be watered down to be easier to get. I'll put them on screen if you're interested, but it's really sad that even the optional achievements were generally approached with the make them more accessible to new players mindset. Meanwhile, there are some things that you would think would make for obvious achievements they still haven't done, like getting every ending in the game at least once, or use every weapon to kill a zombie. Stuff like that was passed over, but we need basically four achievements you're guaranteed for just playing the game long enough. As a longtime fan, this was the game's last chance to give me something to really gravitate towards. Of course, this remake wasn't made for longtime fans. This remake was made for new players. You see, I like the idea of a remake. The idea of getting a game that is a better version of itself, or is expanded beyond the original scope while staying true to its original gameplay, is really nice. But the reality of remakes is that they don't prioritize being better, but often prioritize being more accessible and marketable. For the Resident Evil 2 reimagining, it swapping the gameplay style from fixed camera to traditional third person was not done in the name of improvement, but making it easier for people who don't want to adjust to a different gameplay style than what they're contemporarily playing. In this game, it manifests itself in the form of most of its new content and features being ways of making the game less demanding. Sure, there are things that as a longtime fan I enjoy. I like the skill moves being easier to pull off. It's cool that you can spare Thomas in this version. It's interesting to see the rocket launcher realized. Some of the new books are fun. The survivor AI being less cumbersome is a good thing. But is all of that a full price upgrade? Personally, no. And then there's the lackluster presentation. And the censorship. And the gameplay bugs. And the many rough spots with weapons. And the weaker infinity mode. And the issue with the special forces. And... 
How many things does this remake need to mess up before you're allowed to be disappointed? Because, as a massive fan of Dead Rising 2 myself, I have been listening for the past 14 years about how the first Dead Rising is the better or only good one in the series because of all these little details and the indescribable charm of the original. But now, with many of those details missing, both visually and mechanically, and none of the OG voice cast returning, I am seeing the very same fanbase fight its own logic with this remake, and now try to argue that none of that actually matters. If Capcom Vancouver made this remake, in this state, and released it closer to Dead Rising 4, I am confident people would decry it of how they just don't understand the franchise, and it's time for the Japanese branch to take over. Like, just how desperate are people for a new Dead Rising game to come out? Because, personally, I don't need Dead Rising as a series to continue. Sure, I like the idea of a new Dead Rising to look forward to. I even have my own set of designs for a tie-in game called Dead Rising X that would take place between Dead Rising 2 and 3. But I can play and make videos on the existing games, and this remake should there be interest, for years to come without any new entries. Any new games that come out need to convince me they're worth playing, regardless if it's a remake or a new title. And if I didn't have this YouTube channel, I probably would have passed on this remake. And if the rumors of the sales figures hold any water, plenty of other people had the same idea. Could this remake get patched or have new content added like the odd jobs from Shop to You Drop? Yes, it absolutely can. And I'll cover the updates or additions as or if they come out. But this is the version they sold. I'm not going to excuse them for using people who bought the digital edition as a glorified beta tester for their physical release. Could a follow-up come out and they show that they've learned their lessons from the criticism this one gets? Yeah, there's nothing saying that can't happen, and I would both congratulate and acknowledge it as such. But history repeats far more often than it teaches. It is likely that any future games or remakes in the Dead Rising series will follow the principles and values set forth here, not avert them. Do with this information as you please, but next time Capcom has a deluxe remaster to sell, I'm going to remember what passes for deluxe with this company.